In our last episode on the English Civil War, we discussed the many factors which gradually ramped up the tension between King Charles I of England and his parliament between the late 1620s and early 1630s. Discontent towards the monarch was growing among certain parties, but civil war still seemed absolutely unthinkable to the vast majority of English, who by 1637 had enjoyed nearly a half century of peace. However, war was indeed on the horizon, and in this episode we will explore the events which will escalate the situation beyond all hope of peace, starting with the Scottish Bishops' Wars, the Long Parliament, and the Battle of Edgehill. Your continued support allows us to expand our work, and we're so grateful for that. We're always eager to create more videos for you, and we think that you'll enjoy our documentaries on post-World War II history over on the Cold War channel, and our Wizards and Warriors channel, which focuses on the fantasy and sci-fi lore battle documentaries. We've also recently started a TikTok channel, and would appreciate your support on that new platform. Consider subscribing to all three, the links are in the description and pinned comment. Thanks for being with us. Throughout the latter part of his personal rule, opposition began to mount increasingly against King Charles I. However, this opposition could not be channeled into any meaningful change due to the irregular and infrequent intervals in which Parliament convened. Nevertheless, this state of affairs would soon change due to growing unrest to the north in Scotland, where the meddling of one Archbishop Lord was about to trigger a war. Scotland's decentralised and radically Protestant church, known as the Presbyterian Church, had deeply ingrained roots in the country's lowlands and parts of the highlands. The Scots held on to their native faith lovingly, so when Charles and his administration tried to impose the Anglican Book of Common Prayer on them by royal decree, England's northern neighbour began to implode. Nationalist sentiment was stoked among all the classes, all the way from leading Scottish nobles down to the servant girls, one of whom notoriously threw a stool at the minister in St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh when he attempted to read from the Anglican book. An organised response came on February 29, 1638, when Scottish lords signed the National Covenant, a pledge to uphold the native Scottish religion at all costs. This covenant pledged loyalty to the king, but on the condition that the Presbyterian Church was maintained in its unmolested form. This covenant circled around Scotland and gained rapturous support on all fronts, with its adherents becoming known as Covenanters. Over the next year, attempts at a negotiated solution failed, and war became inevitable. As a result, both sides began to raise their armies, the highly motivated Scots more quickly than the English, many of whom were actually sympathetic to the Scottish cause. Critically, this war footing began to push Charles's finances to the breaking point. To further compound matters, many of his aristocratic financiers were Catholic. The First Bishop's War of 1639 was short and inconclusive, ending with the pacification of Berwick, which both sides realised would not put an end to the conflict. So, both the Scots and the English began preparing for its resumption. However, Charles's war chest had run dry, and with all his sources of finance dried up, he was forced, on April 13th, to summon what would become known as the Short Parliament, the first in 11 years. However, after just three weeks of subsequent stalemate and frustration on both sides, the King dissolved Parliament again on May 5, 1639. Charles then immediately resumed collection of the hated ship money in order to fund his war. The Second Bishops' War of 1640 was a complete disaster for the King. A Scottish army of 20,000 Covenanters, led by the highly competent Earl of Leven, managed to outmaneuver the English, and not long after, defeated them at the Battle of Newburn. Following what was the first Scottish victory on English soil since 1388, Leven occupied northeastern England. As a note, the Earl of Leven, also known as Alexander Leslie, had spent the previous decade fighting in the Thirty Years' War in the service of Sweden's Gustavus Adolphus. We've previously covered his contribution to the Siege of Stralsund. To end this disastrous conflict, 
Charles signed the Treaty of Ripon, the terms of which required that the king pay the Scots £850 per day to maintain their occupation. Now burdened by this new financial drain, in addition to his own army, Charles was once again forced to call a parliament. Holding its first session on November 3, 1640, this would become known as the Long Parliament, because it would not be formally dissolved until March 1660. This time, Parliament was almost totally united against the King, and its more radical Puritan elements, led by the Earl of Warwick, began to dominate affairs. His radical allies tried and executed the Earl of Strafford, Charles's chief minister, began lengthy legal proceedings against Archbishop Lord, and secured other unprecedented concessions from the Crown. All of these demands and more were set out in the Grand Remonstrance, a document of grievances and conditions, the most crucial of which would have deprived the king of many traditionally royal rights and privileges. It didn't seem that Charles was going to accept any further restriction of his power anyway, but an external factor now intervened and made everything that much worse. In October, the month before the king had summoned the Long Parliament, a Catholic revolt had erupted in Ireland. Thousands of Protestants were already dead, and many more were refugees. It was clear that an army would be necessary to quell the Irish. But under whose authority could the army be raised? Parliament no longer trusted the king with military force, fearing that he would use the army against them. While the king would not accept Parliament's control because of the same reason. For some reason, perhaps because Charles had uncovered evidence that his enemies in Parliament had been conspiring with the Covenanters, Charles marched to the House of Commons with 400 soldiers on January 5, 1642. There, he attempted to arrest five MPs, John Pym, John Hampton, Arthur Hazelrig, Denzel Halls and William Strode, the ostensible ringleaders of this imagined Covenanter conspiracy. When this attempt embarrassingly failed, the royal family quickly left London and went to Windsor Castle, fearing that the Parliament supporting London mobs would be riled into a fury against them. From this point forward, King Charles and his opponents at Westminster edged slowly closer to civil war, with each side unwilling to blink, and both sides hoping that the other would do so first. Charles was able to convince many of his English and Welsh subjects that he stood for the defence of their traditional constitution and Elizabethan church doctrine, while Parliament argued that the king ought to be deprived of his remaining constitutional powers as it was clear that he could not be trusted to use them. This too attracted many supporters, as did the widespread Puritan desire in Parliament to undertake radical religious reform. In the end, both sides attracted enough support to take the final step towards civil war. By early 1642, Charles had moved his court north to the city of York. Attempting to seize control of the situation in Ireland and assume military authority of their own, Parliament unconstitutionally issued the Militia Ordinance in March 1642, permitting them to raise an army and appoint its commanders. They chose the staunch anti-royalist Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, whose father had been executed after an attempted coup against Elizabeth I. Now requiring an army of his own to counter that of his enemies at Westminster, Charles passed the equally unconstitutional Commission of Array, allowing the king's chosen commissioners, usually local nobles, to levy troops from their own regions for service in the royal army. As the twin armies slowly began to grow, Charles marched from his base at York to the armoury city of Hull, arriving outside its gates on April 29th. The city contained a vast amount of arms and ammunition, enough to supply the Royalist army's coming campaign if it became necessary. As it turned out, Charles was out of luck. Hull's governor, Sir John Hotham, had flipped to the parliamentary cause and barred the gates to the king, forcing his majesty to retreat in humiliation eventually ending up in Nottingham. It was there that on August 22, 1642, the king officially raised his royal standard on Castle Hill. In what was thought by many to be an ill omen for the coming clash, a storm blew the banner down the following night. 
The campaign began slowly. On September 9th, Parliament's appointed commander, Essex, established a headquarters at Northampton, with the aim of intercepting Charles's army with his own, and preventing any royalist march on London. The king, meanwhile, was still in a bit of a shaky situation. With only five regiments of foot and 500 cavalry troopers by this time, the king's army needed more men. In order to get them, Charles departed from Nottingham September 13th and marched west through Derby, Utoxeter, Stafford and Wellington, eventually reaching Shrewsbury on the 20th. This position allowed the royalists to absorb more units Charles's commissioners had raised in North Wales and Lancashire, swelling his army to a workable size. While this was happening, the royalist horse, under the experienced command of Prince Rupert, took up position in Bridgenorth, aiming to screen any potential parliamentary attack on the main army. Prince Rupert was the son of Frederick V, Elector of the Palatinate, who had failed to gain the throne of Bohemia in 1618, essentially beginning the Thirty Years' War. After being captured by the Holy Roman Empire in a military campaign, Rupert had been freed by the diplomatic manoeuvring of his uncle, Charles I. He subsequently came over to England and gratefully joined the English King's army as an extremely competent cavalry commander. Essex subsequently attempted to prevent a royalist thrust towards London and deter further royalist reinforcements by marching towards Worcester. While the bulk of Parliament's field army was ponderously making its way through the scattered villages of the Midlands, Essex sent two cavalry regiments ahead to secure the west bank of the River Severn. However, when around a thousand parliamentary horsemen ran into a similar number of Prince Rupert's royalist horsemen at Powick Bridge, the former were quickly routed and driven off by Robert's superior tactics. This was the first true engagement of the Civil War, and was, according to parliamentarian Hugh Peters, where England's sorrows began. Buoyed by this initial victory, the now enlarged Royalist army began to move out of Shrewsbury on October 12th, with London as its ultimate objective. Charles would march on the Viper's Nest and end the war here and now. A week later, Essex began his eastward march in pursuit, eventually arriving in the vicinity of Kyneton with the aim of protecting Banbury, while Charles and his army were conducting operations from the nearby town of Edgecott. Because of the two sides' inexperience in war, Insufficient scouting had not alerted either side to the presence of the other so close by. A Royalist Council of War at Edgecott, held on the 22nd, decided that a 4,000-strong brigade would attempt to seize Banbury the next day. By nightfall, the King's army was dispersing into billets around the Wormington Hills, while at the same time, Essex's army finally arrived at Kyneton. While Charles was staying at the home of Sir William Chauncey, Prince Rupert rode to Wormleyton and, seemingly by chance, managed to capture a quartermaster's party from Essex's army, which was nearby. After prying information from the prisoners, Rupert sent a few mounted scouts to Kyneton, who returned at midnight and confirmed that the entire parliamentary army was right there. By 3am on the 23rd of October, Charles was aware that Essex was in the area and an hour later, exhausted officers began to dispatch orders to their men for a general rendezvous near the Edgehill Heights. At this point, the King's Royalist Army was between Essex and London, meaning that it could have marched towards London relatively unopposed. However, Charles and his advisers would not back away from the clash, and decided to do a 180, finally meeting the Roundhead Army near Edgehill, three miles southeast of Kyneton. By the afternoon of October 23rd, the armies of Parliament and King now faced each other across a section of arable land and meadow just northwest of the main slopes. To all those present on both sides, it seemed as though the decisive battle of the war was at hand. With its battle array formed on the level ground just in front of Radway, Charles I's royalists arrayed their army in two lines of battle opting to deploy in the Swedish-style checkerboard formation rather than in the Dutch style, which would allow the second-line regiments to form a continuous front if needed. Infantry brigades in the first line, from left to right, were led by Henry Wentworth, Richard Fielding and Charles Gerard, 
while those to the rear were led by Sir Nicholas Byron and John Bellasis. All appear to have been about the same size, for a total infantry force of just over 9,000 men. Opposite them were Essex's infantry, formed up into three large but loosely formed brigades of roughly 4,000 men each for a total of 12,000 foot. The central brigade took up a mainly defensive position behind a small hill, while the two on the flanks were slightly in front. Most of the cavalry on both sides of the battlefield was present on Prince Rupert's royalist right wing. He held overall command on this flank, had a unit of a thousand dragoons, and was opposed by James Ramsay's parliamentary cavalry. Also on this side of the battlefield was a unit of parliamentary dragoon mobile infantry and musketeers hidden to ambush in a nearby hedgerow. On the other flank, slightly less numerous royalist cavalry under Henry Wilmot faced those commanded by the Duke of Bedford. It's said that King Charles visited every unit of his cavalry and all of his infantry formations in order to review his troops and encourage them for the coming battle. He even wished to ride with his army, but was persuaded to retire to the rear with his small lifeguard cavalry reserve, the majority of which had persuaded the king to let them join Rupert's charge. The first major battle of the English Civil War finally began at 2pm with an artillery duel. Lasting for one hour, neither bombardment inflicted heavy losses and served more as a loud prelude to the real battle. While this was going on, dragoons on Rupert's extreme right wing were able to discover and eventually repel the roundhead ambushes within the hedgerow, providing the main cavalry force with a free run at the enemy. With Essex's army unwilling to move first, fighting began when both of the Royalist cavalry wings launched a thunderous head-on charge at their opposition. Using the latest cavalry shock tactics of direct charge imported from the continent by Prince Rupert, the King's horsemen on both flanks swept away Parliament's cavalry, which still used stationary Dutch tactics of firing from saddleback. A unit of Parliamentarian troopers even deserted and joined the Royalists. With both of Essex's mounted wings swept off the field, it seemed like the time was right for the King's horse to pivot and launch the coup de grace against Parliament's flank and rear. However, due to the indiscipline of its commanders and individual soldiers, who were flushed with the glory of victory, they instead continued chasing the routed enemy. Historians believe that if the Royalist cavalry had halted, regrouped and charged at this point, the English Civil War could have been put to a decisive end, but it was not to be, and the opportunity was lost. With almost all horsemen now off the field, both infantry forces filed into a single line of battle and prepared to advance. Musketeers blasted away and softened up the opposing foot, before the pikemen, wielding their 16-foot-long weapons, came into contact and engaged in a so-called push of pike a shoving match during which the two sides literally pushed each other until one broke. Better equipped parliamentary footmen managed to gain a slight advantage, and casualties slowly began to mount on both sides. Now that all of the Royalist cavalry had victoriously left the field, two parliamentary reserve cavalry units under Sir William Balfour and Philip Stapleton, which had previously been hidden behind a small hill, struck the flanks of Byron's unit. After subsequently bursting through the Royalist centre, Balfour managed to disable a few of the enemy's artillery pieces. Without knowing it, they had also come extremely close to capturing the King's sons, Charles and his brother James. In the midst of the fighting, the King's royal standard was seized by the Parliamentary Infantry, but was then recaptured by a Royalist cavalry officer. By late afternoon, Inexperienced soldiers on both sides were shaken by the experience of battle, and by dusk, Rupert's cavalry returned and stabilised the situation. Neither side had any further stomach for the battle, and both backed off at nightfall. By the time morning came, the Royalists had retreated from the field, and the battle ended as a stalemate. The 1,500 dead soldiers was a small casualty count when compared to the horrors on the continent, primarily due to the terribly cold night which followed the battle at Edgehill 
which helped to seal the fate of many injured troops. Contrary to the expectations of many present, however, Edgehill was not decisive, and the English Civil War would continue into 1643. Our series on the battle between King Charles and his rebellious parliament will continue, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the link in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.